Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk, the most fact-driven, unbiased, true crime channel on the internet. Let's get straight to the docket today. I know, for those of you who are tired of Chris Watts, we've got one more Chris Watts story. Remember how I say it's always about the money? And then when they say it's not about the money, you know it's all about the money? Have you got to listen to this story. Second, Ghislaine Maxwell. More documents are coming her way. Is the government dragging their feet? And why? Third, an innocent man has been released from prison in Tennessee after 15 years. Another teacher case. Can you guess for what the charges might be? The accused in the Ahmed Arbery case are back in court requesting a bond. And finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Crime Talk. My name is Scott Reich. Thanks for watching. If you haven't done so already, we'd please ask that you hit that subscribe button. Hit that little bell over there in the corner so that you receive notifications of when we go live or put up new content. And as always, leave us a comment below. Now, I know there's some people out there that are tired of hearing about Chris Watts. I get it. But we've got one more Chris Watts story. Now, remember what I have said regarding the 12 undeniable truths of life from a criminal defense attorney? Yes, rule number one, it's always about the money. And when they say it's not about the money, then you know it's about the money. Well, take a listen to this story. Now, Chris Watts, obviously in prison for the rest of his life, having pled guilty for the death of Shanann Watts, his two daughters, Celeste and Bella, and also his unborn child. He will never get out of custody. It's simply not going to happen. But what has come out recently, and frankly, this kind of flew under the radar. Chris Watts, while working at Anadarko Petroleum, signed up as part of his employee benefit plan for life insurance. And he listed the people covered by the life insurance, not only obviously if he were to pass away, but if Shanann and Bella and Celeste were to pass away. The payout for these three individuals would be some $450,000. Needless to say, Chris Watts will never share in those proceeds, and thank goodness. Now, had Chris Watts got away with the death of Shanann and Bella and Celeste, he would have pocketed some $450,000. But since he was arrested, ultimately confessed, pled guilty, and is serving a life sentence, he is no longer entitled to those funds as a result of the Colorado Slayer Statute, which basically says, if you are responsible for the death of somebody who is deceased and covered by a policy and you had something to do with, you obviously cannot profit from that. So the situation then becomes what to do with the money. Well, let me give you a quick lesson as it relates to interpleader. It is a tool that's used primarily by insurance companies. And in this particular case, the insurance company, Zurich American Insurance Company, which was to pay out on the life insurance policy, had multiple claims to those proceeds. Now, the first person seeking the funds to the proceeds from the insurance policy were Franklin Ruzek, which is Shanann Watts' father. And he was doing that on behalf of the estate. So let me give you a quick explanation of interpleader. This is a tool that's available under the rules of civil procedure in just as far as I know, every state, as well as in federal court. And in this particular case, Zurich American Insurance Company, the people that had the policy that would have to pay out on the policy said, hey, we're not sure what to do here, judge. We have Franklin Ruzik as the personal representative of the estate of Shanann Watts. We have Franklin uh, Ruzek individually. And then we also have Sandy Ruzek claiming money 
as it relates to this insurance policy, some $450,000. To make things even more complicated, then you have Ronnie and Cindy Watts, who are obviously Chris Watts' parents, saying, no, no, we're entitled to that money. So the insurance company says, hey, hold on. We understand that we have this money and we have to pay it to someone. We're willing to pay it, but it's not our job or our responsibility to decide who gets the money. So Zurich American Insurance Company filed this interpleader action. They list everybody who's making a claim to these monies and list them as a defendant. And then it is upon the court ultimately to decide who gets money and in what amounts, if any. Now, of course, that doesn't assume that the parties can reach a settlement, which you can do at any time. And you'll hear as the story develops here, that's what took place. There's a lot of interesting issues that come in as it relates to this interpleader action. First, we talked about the Slayer statute, which says if you're responsible for the death of somebody, you can't then profit from their death by collecting insurance proceeds. Makes a lot of sense. Well, then who would it then go to? The first thought would be that it would go to Shanann Watts, Christopher Watts' wife. But she obviously predeceased him and she predeceased the children. Now, sometimes in insurance policy cases, it can become very tricky. And I've seen it in, for example, in plane crash cases as to who passes away first, uh, particularly if somebody doesn't have a will, where does it go? Now, normally the beneficiary of the policy would have been Christopher Watts. Had his family died of natural causes in a horrible accident, he would have gotten the money. But since he was responsible for those, he's not entitled to it per statute. So since he has no other relatives, i.e. a wife and children to pass the money on to, then the question goes, would it go to his parents? Then you have the Ruzik saying, oh no, we're entitled to that money because we are the personal representative to the estate and he should not uh, benefit or his family should not benefit in any way by receiving these funds. And as I've stated, this is the reason why Zurich filed an interpleader. Now this matter didn't go very far. The first filings in this case date back to June of this year. And the order regarding dismissal and disbursement of funds was not until September of this year. Now, I'll be honest with you. We follow the Watts case, but we don't follow every courthouse to search for records for the Watts case. But in this particular case, it is public record, and we were able to get all of the filings, which are public information. Now, the matter did settle, and the funds, some $450,000, was made payable to the Rusick's attorney's coltaf or their trust account for disbursement. And in the motion for the dismissal and disbursement, the parties state that they have all settled. Now, we don't know because that information doesn't get filed with the court. So it's unclear whether the Rusicks received all of the $450,000 or whether the Watts family, the parents, received any money from this insurance policy at all. I certainly would love to be able to tell you if that happened, but I simply don't know. Then the question becomes, and obviously the families are certainly entitled to do with whatever money they want to, but then the question becomes, is it something where they're going to take that money and use it for some sort of nonprofit purpose? Or are they going to simply say, we'll never get our family back, and therefore this is some of the compensation uh, for that. Very interesting story. Didn't even know until a couple of days ago that it was taking place. So as soon as we found out, we brought it to you. And next on the docket, Ghislaine Maxwell. Some more documents are going to be heading her way, but the government seems to be dragging their feet on the disclosure. The defense is getting anxious because they want to be able to see what evidence is out there. The prosecutors in this particular case say, hey, we're going to be turning over 1.2 million documents that we have in our possession from 62 devices they seized from that guy named Jeff. Court granted the prosecution a two-week extension earlier this week 
to deliver those materials. As stated, the defense is getting anxious because they want to be able to prepare for the trial for Ghislaine Maxwell. They need to be able to review, analyze, and draft any motions and conduct any further investigation based upon that. The further the government delays, the longer the government delays, the more likely a continuance of the trial date would have to be granted. Additionally, the two non-parties in the now settled civil dispute between Ms. Maxwell had until November 5th to oppose the way their names would be redacted as well as references uh, might be made to identify them. Neither one of those non-parties filed any objection with the court, so those depositions and information will be released as well. The individuals identified in court documents as Doe 1 and Doe 2 provided testimony in the suit which settled back in 2017. They had asked the judge to keep their names and identifying information out of transcripts or depositions that are due to be made public as part of the lawsuit from the Miami Herald, objected or filed any motions objecting to the way that they will be characterized in the suit, and apparently they're satisfied that their identities will be protected. For those of you keeping score at home, Ghislaine Maxwell has been in custody 133 days with no harm coming to her. The count will continue. Next on the docket, when you hear cases like this, you never are sure whether you should be happy that the system works or that obviously it failed. But after serving 15 years for a brutal murder, a Tennessee man has been exonerated by a judge who ruled he was wrongfully convicted. The Davidson County District Attorney's Office announced that after a four-year effort by the attorneys for Joseph Webster to exonerate him, that the district attorney's office is no longer confident in the conviction against Mr. Webster, and they recommend that all of the charges against Mr. Webster be dismissed. He is the first exoneration in the history of Nashville, Tennessee. Webster was convicted of first degree murder, and now we know wrongfully convicted, in the death of Leroy Owens in 1998. Owens was at a friend's house when two men in a white station wagon arrived at the home and began beating Owens over what witnesses to believe to be a drug debt. Owens was able to escape, missing a shoe, and ran to another home. The residents asked Owens, who was disheveled, bruised, and scarred, to leave. When he tried to run again, the men caught up with Owens and he was fatally assaulted with a cinder block. Witnesses at the time identified the man who killed Owens as Mr. Webster. However, several of Owens' family members later told authorities that one of his relatives had admitted to the murder. A car was then found to be owned by that relative. When one of the witnesses who had originally identified Webster saw a photograph of his relative, she identified him as the actual perpetrator she had seen commit the crime, not Mr. Webster. The state and defense counsel submit that the evidence not previously presented to the jury or to the court indicates another individual committed the murder of Leroy Owens. Now, one of the things that we talk about here on Crime Talk repeatedly is the fact that the government has to prove identification, that it was in fact the accused, not someone that looked like him, maybe even using their identity, but it was in fact the defendant, the accused who committed the crime. When you look back at the cases where there have been so many exonerations over the years, obviously DNA comes into play. What does that go to? Identification. And then faulty eyewitness identification. And here, identifications being made of other individuals and that information not being turned over to the defense. So prosecutorial misconduct. So remember that if you're ever selected for a jury, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, the highest form of proof known in the law. It's not a vague, imaginary, or speculative doubt, but a doubt that would cause people to pause in matters of great importance. And when you're looking at questionable ID, i.e. somebody pointing somebody out saying, yes, that's the person that I saw on a dark night where I didn't have a chance to look at them closely or get a good look, 
and I really don't recall, but it looks like it could be him, be very cautious of that. That's the case here that we're talking about with Mr. Webster. So we're certainly happy that the system worked, but we're obviously frustrated by the fact that it didn't work. It didn't work the first time, and Mr. Webster lost 15 years of his life behind bars for a case he didn't commit. Next on the docket, another teacher case. Can you only imagine what this is for? That's right, now a former Pennsylvania middle school gym teacher pled guilty to three counts of statutory sexual assault after abusing a 13-year-old male student. Have you noticed that all of our teachers lately have been females? Coincidence? I'm not sure. Maybe this happened a lot more. Never happened when I was growing up. At least we didn't hear about it. It was always the creepy old men teachers that did everything. The teacher was accused of having sexual contact with the student at least 10 times beginning back in September of 2018 and ending in April of 2019. Now, I'm not sure, but it seems like the female offenders in these types of situations usually wind up with a lower sentence than their male counterparts. In this particular case, Ms. Cressman will have to serve 10 years on probation once she's released from custody uh, where she remained uh, over the last several months. She'll also have to register as a sex offender. And in this particular case, given the threats that were allegedly made by Ms. Cressman, where she said to the young male student, if you tell anyone about what we're doing, she was going to harm herself and harm him. Normally, that is what gets you a prison sentence. But Ms. Cressman was a good lawyering, soft judge, sympathetic prosecutor. Not really sure, but she got a pretty good disposition. Now, let's take a quick recess. Yesterday, we brought you the testimonial of a subscriber who signed up for our background subscription service at crimetalksearch.com. She stated that she met somebody online, and when she checked him out through this background subscription service, found out that he had arrests for some five burglaries and an outstanding warrant. Fortunately, she never went to meet this individual. But that shows the power of information. Just like Ms. Cressman in the last story, people are gonna wanna know, did she do to get in trouble? Why? That's so people can make the right decisions. Needless to say, if you have a young teenage boy, you're not gonna wanna hire Ms. Cressman as your babysitter. And that's what you're gonna find out if you go to crimetechsearch.com. You'll get a background search. It's done anonymously. No one's gonna know about it. You're gonna get criminal records. You're gonna get property records. You're gonna get civil judgments, bankruptcies. You're gonna find out what information is related to them on social media, emails, and phone numbers? Why do they have five or six phone numbers or emails associated to them, but they're only telling you about one? Is that maybe because he has all these other Tinder accounts set up? Those are things you wanna ask about and find out. Go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. Next on the docket, Travis McMichaels, got a handful of folks going to bat for him as he looks to be released from jail on bond. So far, five people have spoken on Travis's behalf, including his mom, his best friend, and they're telling the judge he's a great father and generally happy person who wouldn't flee the jurisdiction. As you may recall, the father and son charged with murdering Ahmed Arbery are back in front of the judge as they try to get out of jail on a bond pending their trial. Travis McMichael and his father, Gregory, are going before the judge to ask and convince the judge that they be released. William Roddy Bryant, the other man who is involved and charged, who is allegedly the one that recorded Ahmed's slain, is also expected in court. Now, he was first denied bond back in July, and the judge says, no way, you're a flight risk. Now, understand, when somebody is facing felony murder charges, or charges relating to murder after deliberation. Normally, you're not given a bond. You are deemed and presumed to be a threat to the community and a flight risk. Let's face it, when you put your mom up to say, he's not gonna flee, what the hell is your mom gonna say? They're gonna say you're a good guy. This isn't about whether he's a good guy. He may have been a great guy up until this day regarding the incident with Ahmed Arbery. And in this particular case, that's the only thing that matters. The charges, the possible penalties, 
And yes, they need to consider his ties to the community. Is he a flight risk? But if the judge were to grant a bond, it should be so high that frankly, he wouldn't be allowed to make it. Now, as a defense attorney, obviously you prefer to have your clients out of custody. But when you do cases involving people being charged with murders and homicides, you have to expect to have to go to jail. You have to prepare your client that he's not going to get out on bond and that he may never see freedom again. At the time that we recorded this video, the judge has not made a decision. But by the time of editing, we'll try to let you know what happened. My guess is no bond is going to be granted for these individuals. Now, one of the things the court will also have to consider is the strength of the case against these individuals. Now, we've talked about this early on, and I got a lot of heat from people. And I said, these three individuals are in big trouble. They were not justified under any of the law. Remember, we pulled the jury instructions and went through them, and the whole stand your ground, uh, going after somebody who's committing a crime, doesn't apply in this particular case. And the fact that the Travises go and chase somebody with a shotgun and get out of the car, they're gonna have a real tough road if they try to claim self-defense. I think all of these men will be remaining in custody until a jury can decide whether they are guilty or not guilty. And we'll see if I'm correct or not. We'll let you know. Next on the docket our dumb criminal contestant of the day. We have talked about airplane incident cases on Crime Talk before. Meet Sierra Nicole McClinton. She got into an altercation with another passenger when she was on her flight from Jacksonville, Florida to Houston, and the flight had to be diverted to Mobile, Alabama, where the 25-year-old passenger became rather disruptive to the point where she was removed from the plane in only her underwear and a t-shirt. Observers thought that Miss McClinton may have consumed alcoholic beverages. Now, there weren't any alcoholic beverages served on this particular flight, so she must have done it before she got on the plane. It's also unclear what the disturbance was with the fellow passenger and why did Miss McClinton have to take off her clothes. After the plane was diverted, the non-unruly passengers got to continue on to Houston, but Miss McClinton got to stay in custody. When she was escorted off the plane by law enforcement, she was wearing only a t-shirt and underwear and was yelling obscenities to everyone. She was charged with disorderly conduct and public intoxication. Now, Miss McClinton, take my words wisely. First, you have become the dumb criminal contestant of the day because obviously you can't handle your alcohol and it impairs your ability to make good judgments. However, if you are taken before the court and you are given an opportunity to plead guilty to this disorderly conduct and public intoxication, you may want to do it immediately. Why, you say? That's right. The United States Attorney's Office is more than likely going to pick up this case and you are going to be charged with disruption of an air crew. That's right. When you interfere with an air crew, i.e. making them restrain you and then making them divert to a different location because of your unruliness, guess what? You're going to prison. You're more than likely going to prison. Like I said, I've handled these cases never had anybody go to prison. The feds pick it up and you're going to be looking at felony charges. So Miss McClinton, you could have just waited on that short flight from Florida to Houston to have a few adult beverages. You couldn't. You couldn't control yourself. And now look at the mess that you have got yourself in. You are the dumb criminal contestant of the day. Congratulations. Now, if you are the winner for the week, that's right. I am personally going to hunt you down and find you and make sure that you receive your Crime Talk mug. After all, it may be the only bright spot of your week. Now, if you would like your own Crime Talk gear without having to become the dumb criminal contestant of the day and ultimately the winner, that's right. Hit the link below. It'll take you right to the merchandise and you'll order it and have it in time for Christmas. They make great stocking stuffers. Get it for your uh, boyfriend, your girlfriend, your spouse, your significant other. Buy it for them 
And if they don't want it, get it in your size so you can wear it and you can have your morning cup of coffee from your Crime Talk mug. All right. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.